Section 4.4 deals with the graphs of the last two circular functions, secant and cosecant. We'll first discuss the graph of secant. Now, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So its graph is the reciprocal of the cosine graph, meaning that they're intimately related. So we're going to have to be graphing some cosine functions to be able to graph a secant function. Since it is the reciprocal, its range must also act like the reciprocal, or all of the values where cosine is not defined. So since cosine has a range from negative 1 to 1, that means that secant is going to have a range from negative infinity to negative 1, and then from 1 to infinity. So let's graph what this might kind of look like. So you'll notice, again, in our list of values, we have some values that are undefined. Now this makes sense because, again, there are some places where cosine is equal to zero. So the reciprocal of zero, <coughs> sorry, is undefined, meaning there will still be vertical asymptotes like there were for a tangent and cotangent across this graph. These are going to be at negative pi over two, at pi over two, and if you can make some assumptions, at three pi over two, and on and on across the entire domain. Now, if we plot the sine, sorry, the cosine function real quick, and I'm going to do this just in like a regular black color here. We know that it starts at 1, hits the x-intercept, goes to 1, hits the x-intercept, goes to 1. If we work backwards, it would look like this. And this makes sense to me because we know that everywhere that this cosine function hits the x-axis, there is a vertical asymptote for what we are going to graph, which is secant. But if we graph the secant function, if we plot the points mm. that we have here in the graph, we see that at negative pi over 4, we're at square root of 2, which is approximately 1.44. So I would be approximately here. And at 0, 1. And at pi over 4, again up here. Then we jump down, and we're at negative square root 2, which is negative 1.44. So it would be here-ish and then negative one, and then here-ish. And if we follow this pattern, you can kind of see what's happening here. When we play connect the dots with these functions, we do have to maintain the idea of vertical asymptotes, which means we can only touch these points and then get close to the vertical asymptote before we have to jump down and connect the dots down here, and then jump back up and connect the dots up here. To me, these look like bowls. That's not an official mathematical language, but to me, they look like bowls because they're reciprocals of the curve created by cosine. So this graph is discontinuous or has vertical asymptotes of the form pi over 2 plus pi times n, so re repetitions of that every pi distance. There are no x-intercepts because of that is where the cosine function would be equal to 0, so that's where our vertical asymptotes appear. The period of the secant function is back to being 2 pi, because if you notice, starting at 0, we're at a bowl that has like a minimum. It's not a minimum, but it looks like a minimum. The next time we reach a bowl with a minimum is at 2 pi. There are no official minimum or maximum values because of the arrows going off to the top and down to the bottom, and it has no amplitude. But if we think about the cosine function in between it, the cosine function that creates this secant function does have maxes and mins and does have amplitude. So if you connect those together, the secant function technically does not have maxes and mins or an amplitude, but the cosine function it relates to does. This graph, because you can fold it along the y-axis, is symmetric about the y-axis, which means that it is an even function. And for our even odd identities, the secant of negative x is equal to positive secant x. Again, that will come in handy in chapter 5. So that is what the secant function looks like. Again, it's the reciprocal of cosine. But we can also graph the cosecant function. The cosecant function is the reciprocal of sine. So if we think about sine values, sine is going to have a range of negative 1 to 1, just like cosine. And so cosecant has the reciprocal range, again, from negative infinity to negative 1, and then again from 1 to infinity. Similarly to secant, if we graph all of the places where there are vertical asymptotes for this graph, which is where sine is equal to zero, I would make my denominator zero, we have a vertical asymptote at zero, we have a vertical asymptote at pi, and we have a vertical asymptote at two pi. 
Now this makes sense since this is related to sine and if we plot the typical sine function, the typical sine function looks something like this. So we would have this function happening, which is sine, and everywhere that the sine function crossed the x-axis or was equal to zero, we now have a vertical asymptote for a cosine. I mean, sorry, for a cosecant. Plotting these values, I see at pi over six, we're up at two. At pi over three, we are at approximately 1.15, which is here-ish. And then we're at one and then back up like this. So if I plot these points, or at least giving me those important ones like this, we see that the bowls, again, lack of a better word for the word bowls, the bowls of this graph are also bounded on the left and the right by these vertical asymptotes. So just like sine and cosine look similar, secant and cosecant look similar because they're just reciprocals of their respective graph. The graph is going to be discontinuous at x values of the form 0 plus pi times n, so 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, all the values after that. It has no x-intercepts because it can't touch the x-axis. That's where cos or that's where sine touches the x-axis. The period of cosecant, like the period of sine, is 2 pi. It has no maximum and minimum values and no amplitude, but the sine function that creates this cosecant function does have a max and min and an amplitude. It is symmetric with respect to the origin, and origin means that the function is odd. For cosecant, the cosecant of a negative x is equal to the negative cosecant of x. We'll come back to that in chapter 5. So when we graph these kinds of functions, just like I did when we were plotting these, the technique that we're going to use for graphing is we're always going to use sine or cosine as a guide. So we're going to be plotting not only the secant version, the actual function we care about, but also the sine or cosine that it is related to. So if we look at this, and again, I'm leaving the table behind for those other sections. If you liked graphing with all of that table work, that guarantees you to get the right answer. But we're going to use A, B, C, and D with the transformations and what we know about the basic shapes of sine and cosine. I know that y equal to 2 secant 1 half of x is going to be related to y equals to 2 cosine of 1 half x, because secant and cosine are reciprocals. Based on these numbers I have here, it tells me that the a value is 2 and that the b value is 1 half, which then means that the period of this function is 2 pi divided by 1 half or 4 pi. So that means between 0 and 4 pi, I should create 1 entire uh, cosine wave. So here's 2 pi and here are my middle points. We'll go ahead and graph two periods of this. So here's negative 4 pi, negative 2 pi, negative 3 and negative 1 pi. Okay, with an a value of 2, that means that my sine function is going to go up to 2 and down to negative 2. Sorry, my cosine function. So we can plot those points. Again, I'm going to plot cosine and sine in just like regular black. I'm not going to use dashed lines because it's too many dashed lines when we get into it. But if you remember the pattern for cosine, which we've been doing for a while, max, min, max, center, min, center, max, and working backwards, the same pattern arrives. We have that the cosine version with these constraints for A, B, C, and D looks something like this, which means for us, to graph the secant version of this, everywhere this cosine touches the x-axis or is equal to zero, you will now have a vertical asymptote. So I see all of these places where this graph crosses the x-axis and I'm going to put vertical asymptotes. Didn't make these long enough. Beyond that, what I want for your secant and cosecant graphs is to make sure you reflect the bowls or actually use the reciprocal. For, so for secant, that means that the max of the cosine wave creates the bottom of a bowl, and the minimum creates the top of a bowl. And I'm bounded on the left and the right by those vertical asymptotes. So this is what the cosecant, the 2 times the cosecant of 1 half x, would look like, the blue part of this graph. It is weird to see because there's so much happening here. Remember, the black graph I've graphed is cosine. 
So its reciprocal secant is the blue graph. This is the actual graph I wanted you to graph. We use sine or cosine as a guide when we're doing this. Let's see another one. For this function, we're going to graph eventually 3 over 2 cosecant of x minus pi over 2. But first, we're going to graph its corresponding sine or cosine. So if I think about what cosecant is related to, that is related to sine. So I'm actually going to plot first 3 over 2 sine of x minus pi over 2 using techniques that I understand. I know that the a value is 3 over 2. There's no change to the period because there's no number multiplied in front of x, but there is a phase shift. I'm going to use ps for phase shift. This phase shift should be pi over 2 to the right. So we're going to shift our graph to the right. Let's go ahead and graph or plot these x coordinates on our axis here. So this is pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 4 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2 completes an entire period. I'm going to graph two periods of this function, so I'm going to work backwards. This would be 0, negative pi over 2, negative 2 pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2. That'll finish off two periods for me. Now I also know that the amplitude of the sine version of this is 1.5. So here's 1, here's 2. That means I'm going to be in between that for my amplitude. If we plot the points we know from at least just the first period, we know that starting at pi over 2, we have our middle, and then at the next tick mark, we go to a maximum, and then a middle, and then a minimum, and then a middle. Continuing this pattern the other side, we'd go at 0, we'd be at a minimum, and then a 0, and then a maximum, and then a 0. So this is two periods of the sine version for these constraints. Now again, we're not graphing sine anymore, we're graphing cosecant, which means everywhere that the sine function crosses the x-axis, you should now visually see a vertical asymptote. So I have all of these vertical asymptotes everywhere that I had this middle line. There's so many. Okay, now we need to plot cosecant. If we plot cosecant, that means that we are just doing the reciprocal of each of these. So I need to make sure that I have the bowls bounded by the vertical asymptotes, but touching that maximum or minimum of the cosine wave each section. So I have two periods of the cosecant function graphed that has a vertical dilation of 3 over 2, 1.5, and has been phase shifted pi over 2 to the right. To connect these graphs with equations, similarly to how we did with tangent and cotangent, we're going to look for visual cues to decide what kind of function we're talking about. I think the easiest thing to do here is to decide what kind of function you have for the reciprocal of what's seen, meaning is it sine or is it cosine as a reciprocal? And if I look at this and I play connect the dots here for where there's vertical asymptotes and maxes and mins, this is a sine function. So that means since I have a sine function in the middle, it means that the one that, the, that is graphed here is going to be cosecant. All I need to know now is the a, the b, the d, and the c value. Well, the a value comes if there's any stretch or shrink, or if there's a different amplitude to the sine or cosine function, and there's no change here, so this is just one. The b value comes from if there's a change to the period. So if I look at the period of this function, it takes approximately 4 pi units for me to complete this shape. So b is going to be 2 pi divided by 4 pi, 2 pi being the normal period. 2 pi divided by 4, 4 pi is a half. Since I have a middle happening at the origin, or a center line happening at the origin, there is no phase shift, and there is no change to the middle line. Which means that the function here would be best represented by y equal to the cosecant, of x divided by 2, or 1 half x. Looking at the next example, again, if I look in between here to see what would be happening in between, I see that I'd start at a maximum, get to a center, go to a minimum, get to a center. So that means that we are dealing with a cosine function in the center, which means this is a secant function that is graphed. 
Now we just need A, we need B, we need C, and we need D. Again, the A has to do with where the middle line to the amplitude of cosine would be. And I'm going to go ahead and draw in the middle line here. I think that would be helpful. That middle line is at 1. Oh, I switched up these letters. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I got those letters backwards. This should be D and then C. So my middle line here is at 1. That's where all of the vertical asymptotes hit the middle of the invisible cosine function. All right, cool. But that amplitude is just 1 because the distance from this middle line to the amplitude of the invisible cosine function is just 1. Again, we look for the distance from like maybe a max to a max or for the shape to repeat. And it takes this long for the shape to repeat. So from negative pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, that's 2 pi distance. That's normal. So if I was actually using this formula, 2 pi divided by 2 pi is 1. There's no change to the letter B. Since, again, this is starting at a maximum for the cosine function or at a lower bowl, there is no phase shift here, so that would be a zero. Which means that the only thing I'm including in my function this time is the C value. So this should be one plus the secant of X, or secant of X plus one, because the midline has been shifted up. The main thing to think about with secant and cosecant is what function appears invisibly, you can't see me, but I'm air quoting, appears, in between the bowls, again, air quotes, of the secant and cosecant graph. Here I see that this would create a sine function, and here I see that this would create a co um, cosine function. 